Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We thank the Most High for being here today. We thank you for his goodness, kindness, and his mercy. We thank you for the love that he has bestowed upon us by keeping our bodies here. We thank you for each and every last one of you that I see here today. We thank you for, you know, just showing us evidence that he still has us in his hands. We thank you for food, clothing, and shelter that he has provided for his people. And we just thank him for just his love and kindness. We thank him for, you know, our loved ones and how we continue to pray for them. Although they might not be here with us, we yet pray for them. We just thank the most out for how he gives us that desire to keep them in our prayers. And um, we just thank the most out just for everything. We thank him for another set of our feast day we're going to come up on, um, Shabbat in a few weeks. And just looking for a great time, and we're going to come out of fellowship and enjoy each other. So we just thank the most out for that. And without any further ado, we're going to get into our lesson. We're going to continue from a lesson we started uh, about a month ago on the uh, two houses, or the Gentiles. Because there's a teaching or school of thought that has gone out throughout, throughout the earth that when we read the epistles of Apostle Shaul that New Testament recipients of the good news are nations or people that are outside of the nation of Yashra. But as we begin to read in the scriptures, we're going to find out that the message has always been to the house of Jacob or the whole house of Jacob. And so what we want to look at when we begin to read the scriptures it's imperative that you have an understanding of what took place within the quote-unquote Old Testament, as they call it. When we read in the Torah and Tanakh, we see something take place with the house of Jacob, or the house of Jacob, that has been a split or a dividing within the house. So in other words, when we begin to read, it's imperative that you understand that each one of the two houses represents a daughter or a woman or a bride or a wife. So, when we read what took place at Sinai, we see that the house of Jacob or the 12 tribe of Israel entered into a marriage agreement with Ab Yahuwah. You have to know that have to understand what took place at Sinai. So they entered into a marriage agreement or a marital contract, which is a marriage or Hebraic marriage to two people. And so when we look at that, we see after they entered into this agreement, there arose problems. The first thing they did, they answered and agreed to the term of a marital contract without reading the obligation and thoroughly combing through to figure out what was being asked of them by Abihuah. So, when they sent back word and said, go tell your Elohim those things what she say, we will do. In other words, they said, I do. Then we see from that time, moving forward, that there was discord between the 12 tribes, that there was a split. So one house has now become what? Two houses. Has become two. So you have Ab Yahuwah, who is the strength and the father of the house. Now, his house has what? Been divided. So now you have two Ishahs under the rule of one husband in one house who cannot what? Get along. Get along. So moving forward, what are we seeing? We'll see Ab Yahuwah extended his love to these same two women to bring back unity, order, and structure back within his house. Back within whose house? Yes. His house, the Father's house. And so that's what you see. So as we begin to read in uh, part one, we found out that there was a split between the two houses, and that split began to start under what circumstances took place that the split began to start, or there was a split. Okay, y'all, Jeroboam Rehoboam, right? There was a disagreement. All of a sudden, we have a switch. 
and around what time period was that? After Sodom and Seven what? When the split began? Uh huh. Seven twenty one. Yeah, roughly, uh, roughly around 721, 722 BC. No, yeah. And so what we have here is you see now a split takes place within the home. Now, it's possible for there to be a cod in unity within the home, even with the two, as long as they would walk in agreement of what the father or the obligations that the father has extended to them. He even came to them. Did he not tell them he was the cause of the split? Right. When they were warned against each other, taking each other alive? Yeah. He told you it was him. He did. So when we look at this, you're going to see the father just reaching out to what? To a contrary bride, to a contrary wife, all throughout the scripture. Extending his love in so many ways to what brings them back into covenant relationship with him. How many of y'all know you can't have peace in your home if you're not in covenant relationship? Do you not know in order to be in covenant relationship, you have to be what? Subject to the authority and the man of the house in humility? Now let me tell you the problem I have when it comes to today's relationship law. We still talk about the two hours. And so when all of a sudden, when you begin to look how a relationship is established throughout the scriptures, now when we go back and examine and see what took place at Sinai, when we look at this story, who's Ketubah is it? Father's Father's house. It's Yahuwah. It's his Ketubah. Is he not extended this to a bride yes. and he's asking her to tell him what he expects am I right yes. show me a scripture and show me chapter verse and book where the woman is telling the man what she wants got a thousand dollars Show me at what time during that whole betrothal did the woman tell Yahuwah, I want you to do this. If you don't do this, I'm not going to do that. At what, uh, at what time did Yahuwah tell that those, those things that you say I will do? It wasn't about her getting him to obligate to her. It was about him getting her to obligate to fulfill his obligation. So when we go back to the scripture, you see this pattern all the way through. And the only way you can be in covenant relationship is to be what? Into subjection and humility unto your husband. And guess what your husband's supposed to be in subjection to? Yahuwah, how is, he, how is a husband or each in subjection to Yahuwah? Say it again, bro. By being obedient to his word. By being obedient to his word. And what is his word? The Torah. So if the man is obedient and in subjection to Yahuwah by subjecting and being in submission to his Torah, what is the woman is subjected to? The man. The man. And how, how does she subject to the man? What does he uh, instruct her with? The Torah. The Torah. We're all subject to the same thing. <laughs> it's just that you can't go straight to the Father. He structured and gave you protocol and order. You go to um, Yahushua, Yahushua, Yahushua goes to the father, the wife goes to the husband. That's an order, but we're all are subject to what? The Torah, that's not anybody in the structure or the protocol that has been set up that's not um, what? Subject to Torah. What y'all thought Yahushua was subject to? This instruction of his father, he said, I come to do what? The will of my father. He said, I come not speaking what? My words, but the word for him who has what? Sin. Sent me. We're all in subjection and submission to what? The father's instructions. And what has happened throughout time is, because coming out of some of the um, 
secular institutions and all, what we have done is we bypassed the Father and overlooked him and gave our full attention to Hamashiach, Yahushua. And he didn't ask you to do that. Right. You notice he always pointed you back where? To back to the Father. It was always about the Father. But something happened that the Father himself Yahusha did not come do any of that on his own. Matter of fact, how you know he did? When he prayed in the garden, what did he tell the Father? He said, if it be your will, what? Let this cup pass. Let this cup pass me. What kind of cup was it? A bitter cup. A bitter cup. Why was it bitter? Was it intentionally bitter? But why was it bitter? He's talking about a betrothal cup. The bitterness was because of that hard-headed, disobedient woman. You mean to tell me I got to give my life and this this She don't love me. She's not submissive. She's sleeping all around with other men. She's not listening to me as I instruct her. So y'all remember when we did the um the marriage ketubah? Uh, 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 he bred marriage words. There's four covenants, but each covenant that what? There's a marriage what? There's a meal. And there's a, a betrothal cup that has to be drank. Am I right? Yes. And the first covenant, you have the friendship, the salt, the sandal, and blood. What happened at the all the covenant? Each covenant is progressive in nature. You can't go from one to, and go to the next unless you are in full agreement. When you go from the friendship to the salt covenant, the next the covenant, the third covenant is what? It's a sandal covenant. But something changes with that. The husband and the east drinks at the first covenant. The husband and the east drinks at the second covenant. At the third covenant, only the Isha drinks by herself. But in return, the east washes the feet of his bride. At the fourth covenant, which the marriage supper takes place, or the covenant of peace, what happens? They drink together at the marriage supper. Right. And this is what Hamashiach said what? He said, take you and drink you all of this, for this is my what? My blood, which was shed for what? For who? For the original sin. For the original sin, or the new what? Right. Covenant. But what did he tell him when he said? He said, take you and drink you all of this. He said, for I shall not drink with you when? When? I'm not drinking now, but until I drink again new in my father's kingdom. Say it again, say it loud. I drink again anew in my father's kingdom. He was going to drink again new in his father's kingdom because the groom of the east does not drink at the third covenant. But did he wash his feet, um, his tap of dead feet? Yes, sir. And what did he tell Peter when Peter um, said he wanted to lie him through that? If you don't mind wash his feet, he's not his. He said, if you don't allow me to do this, you can have no part with me. Or you cannot be in a car or be in covenant relationship with me. This is required. Lord, can I read it? Go ahead. Go ahead and read it, Lord. Let's read it. Uh, the book of Luke, the 13th chapter. And uh, 13, it is 14. 13, 14. See the book of John. Yeah, the book of John, the 13th chapter, 14. Yes, four, uh, 13. Give me something. 1313. You call me master and sovereign, and you say, Well, for so am I. If I then, your sovereign and your master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So that's the one. Uh, that's it, Lorraine. Right. Okay, and so you see this pattern, but you'll also see this pattern throughout the book. Um, when you see this take place, you have to know what's going on here. All of these
these things are pertaining to what? A marriage. But who's getting married? Did not Yahshua enter into what? A marriage agreement at Sinai? Mm -hmm. But no sooner than they entered into the marriage, what happened? They broke it. They broke it. So the marriage was never what? Consummated. It was never consummated. It has to be completed. The marriage was never consummated. And this is what the whole book is about. But when we get into the two houses, when you see what's happening, on, it's imperative that you know what has happened to these people, what has happened to the 12 tribe. Why, when you get over to the epistles of Apostle Shaul, and when you start getting into the Messianic teachings of the New Testament, you have to show, well, if he's not talking to Yahshua, what nation is he talking to? And you've got to be able to show at what point in time did he enter into a marriage agreement or a covenant agreement with that nation. And I don't think you can find one nation that he did that with outside of Yahshua. Go ahead, I'll keep you. Oh, just so I can make sure I'm understanding. So, since the marriage was never consummated, does that mean we've only been in a betrothal? That's, what, that's exactly what you've been in, a, a betrothal. Absolutely. You've been in a courting stage. And the difference between what we think is engagement and betrothal, then that woman was already considered to be yours. Yeah, she's, yeah. Once she goes through that betrothal yeah, period. Yeah, once she goes through that betrothal period, once it begins, you get into an agreement with the Father. Period. She's yours. She's taken off the market. You have not lain with her, you've not slept with her, but she's your Isha. And that's why the first thing you have to do is what? You have to bargain with the Father. And there's a bargaining price that has to be paid. Did not Yahushua tell his Isha? Uh, of each other be that you're not your own, you've been bought with a price. Right. And what was that price? It's like, uh, he told the father, I'll tell you what, if you let me have her, if you give her me her for my bride, in return, I'm going to give you my life. But that was the plan with Yahuwah all along. It was never about what Hamashiach on his own wanted to come do for you. It was about what Yahuwah knew he had to do in order to bring you back into covenant relationship. And what was that he had to do to bring you back into covenant relationship? Huh? Kill the husband. Yeah, the husband had to die, but also, y'all remember the guilt offering? When we talked about what happened with the guilt offer, retribution has to be paid for the damages that have been done. Right. Yahuwah himself, he gave his son. He said, I love you, so I'm going to do this for you. Not my son is going to do this for you. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to take my precious son, my firstborn, because I love you, so I'm going to take his life so that I can bring you back into relationship with me. Wow. It's hard, but it's right. And this is why I tell you, we got to stop playing. We really don't know seriously what he, what he did for us. And we get, we're get living in a time now. I'm going to get back on these two houses because I'm really I'm not leaving. I'm just going from another angle here. Let me tell you all something. We're living in a time now. This damn feminist movement that they got going on in the world. <laughs> this faith is sent a lot of people to hell. They have a lot of people outside the wilderness. Right. Because it has crept over into the nation of Yahshua, into the congregation. A husband about that can't hardly tell his wife nothing. <laughs> I'm serious. A man can't even hardly say anything to his wife nowadays without there being some kind of feelings being hurt. And it's not like you ask him to do anything wrong. So you shouldn't be asking him to do anything outside of the Torah. Yeah. It's a reason why he gave you a husband and a leader or a head. You can't think on your own. We know that from the garden. Because you, you'll tip off somewhere back off in the cut and you'll be up in another man's face. And then you'll be done some BS to me. Now both of us outside of the kingdom. Both of us outside of the kingdom. Because you 
in a place where you shouldn't be talking to someone you shouldn't be talking to. We're living in a time now, all of a sudden, we're in the same house, but each one of us have our own mind. That's impossible, not a covenant relationship. Because if we all follow the Torah, guess what? We should be following the same thing. You got a question? Oh. No. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So, what is taking place is now you have something where women feel like they're equal to their husband. Let me tell you something about a, a covenant um, marriage and a Torah lover or a Torah lover husband. He's not going to ask you to do anything to put you in jeopardy, put you in danger. He's going to love you. He's going to respect you. The only time problems come in is when you have your own mind and you think you should do something somewhere. No, if it's no, it's my way. I'm telling you to do it this way for a reason. To keep you from bumping your head. And then you come in here with knots on it because you got out of the will of your boy. The only thing you should be doing is what I'm asking you to do. The only thing I should be asking you to do is that which falls under the ground of the Torah. You might think, well, I feel like I should be able to do this. I feel like I should be able to do that. Says who? Who keep telling you that? What you need to do is whatever it takes to build this house as I give instruction on how I need it to be built. Am I out of the door? No. no. I know that's the theme of whole entire book we read. Go ahead, I'll keep. You said that's not just, not just for uh, the wife, uh, the Isha, it's for everybody in the house. It, yeah, it's for everybody in the house. But as the order goes down, it goes from you to the Eshaw. She, what's her, what's the dude of the Eshaw? The rules and regulations that you have established to govern your house. When you're outside of the house, guess who's supposed to enforce those? The Eshaw. The Eshaw. And if that's being done, guess what? Everybody's in, uh, in agreement, a call in unity. That house is floored harmoniously as what? One. Because there's only one mindset where? In the house. Am I making any kind of sense? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Go ahead. And I think what a lot of people have ended up missing is when you are a cloud like that, that's when the power of you is able to manifest in the home. Yes. And, uh, only then. And yes. he don't dwell, he won't dwell and manifest in confusion. There's no such thing as 50 50 in your hood book. That means we're equal. We both are individuals. There's no individuality in his book or in his house. That means there are two heads. And I'm talking to more records about the last time I heard anything that had two heads was a freak or a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, it, it sounds comfortable, but it's true. It's like the Highlander said, that can only be one. Because I'm telling y'all something. Watch this. Y'all don't see what's going on throughout the earth? Anytime they come to what law they're trying to uh, effeminate the men, uh, what they were talking about that thing, uh, about masculinity being a, a, a mental sickness, toxic, yeah, yeah. toxic, toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity. You don't want no man with his wrist bending and all that craziness. He got more twitch and twist in his hip than you got. You want a man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They don't say there's no toxic masculinity. But you have to know the wiles of Shatan and what he comes to do. You want your sons to grow up to be what? Men. You want your daughters to grow up to be what? Women. This is madness out here. It is all because we don't want to follow and line up with what has been written. We don't like this structure. But that's the only thing that's going to keep you in the will of your whore. His structure. You don't believe it. Let's see how the nation of Yahshua 
how they walked while they were in the wilderness. Who was her husband? You're whore. What happened in the wilderness? Did he not lead her by what? Cloud by day? Fire by night? What happened when your whore decided to go over here? Say it again, Conti. They went over there. When he rested right there, what did she do? She rested too. She sat up behind down. And she stayed there until he what? He got ready to move. You see the order? It's all about when the husband move, you move. When the covering move, you move. Your safety is what? In the covering. In the covering. It's in the covering. Don't let these people fool you with all this madness they got going on out, out here in the world. Got you all of a sudden, you got a mindset, now you can stand up to your husband. Now, he said one thing, and you got all this chin bumping in the background about why you ain't going to do it. <laughs> and what you think you ought to do. <laughs> and this is what causes the problems in the house. I'm not talking just about in your, your, your uh, physical home, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about where you are who as well. Right. But see, I'm going to tell you what has happened. The men have taken on the position of Moses. Instead of them letting your whore deal with his wife, they stand and intercede, they get in the way. Mm -hmm. No, don't kill your whore, don't destroy your whore. Please, no. <laughs> I, I intercede. And that's the problem. Until you let your whore go upside a couple of naps out, you will never have more than that house. <laughs> it sounds funny, it sounds funny, it sounds funny. But I'm telling you, don't you know any man that loves his wife will correct her? And I'm not talking about being a tyrant and a dictator and all that. You show up within the word, the pattern and the structure of how it's laid out in the word. And so, baby, I know you might not understand this now. It might not make sense to you. But trust me, if you follow it like I'm asking you to, it'll all make sense. And you'll begin to understand why it has to be done that way. And you don't even gotta even look in the word to figure that out. Start looking, start looking around your neighborhood. Y'all gonna find it strange? Just about one out of every five men, men you see. No, I take that back. Yeah. One out of five five is straight or somewhat. One out of ten. Or one out of ten. <laughs> what has happened that this has come about? I remember a time I used to ride the train in Atlanta. I started seeing 12 year old girls, 13 year old girls, just sitting on the train kissing in public like it ain't nothing. And when dad you to say something. And now you start seeing this thing, it has what? Just start permeating all throughout the job. All, I don't care where you go, it just open with it. You know why? It shows you the importance of having a man in the house to lead and govern over everybody. You got to know and see that this is one of the wiles of the enemies. The enemy knows what it takes to destroy the nation of Yahshua. Get that woman to be in contention with that man in the house. That's why they know if the woman is in contention with the man, there's no order in the house. So that's, there can be no governing in the house. Because nobody's hidden the proper authority. What's the first thing they did when we come up out of slavery? And they start um, giving you extended welfare and all that stuff to you. Yeah. Didn't they tell you, oh yeah, you can get these food stamps, you can get this government assistance, you can get this wig. But he got to go. Yeah. So when he goes, the structure leaves. And that's what's wrong with the, in a lot of our houses. The man has gone. He's physically in the house, but because you have deaf ears to the words that are coming from the man, it's just like he's not there. And this is causing problems within our home. 
And this is why you see in the book right now, when we read about these two houses, what's going on within your world's house? Is it not the same thing we're talking about today? Is he not allowed the enemy to kick her behind from, uh, from the exodus all the way to Revelation just about? Because she won't hit her each. She done laid up and listened to every other man's whistle sweet nothing in her ear, but she won't listen to her very own husband. And when you don't listen to your husband or your cover, it causes you to get yourself put in a predicament that it takes the grace of your whore to get you out of it and pull you out of it. But we're, we're, but we're lucky in the nation of Yahshua all because you love your Esha soul until you don't want to see anything happen. You tell your whore, I'm having problems at my home, you know, I'm trying to govern my home, seeing like Shaitan has uh, crept in and he's brought about division, discord, and I really need you to bring order back to my house. This is your prayer to your whore. But guess what? You really don't want him to do what you ask him. Because you're scared how he might do what you ask. Because we keep forgetting your hood on play. I've read when he opened up the earth and swallowed 20 and 30,000 at one time. You pray, but you're scared because you love that individual and you don't want your hood to put him in a little rectangle of a box and drop it six feet down in the ground. You love him because you don't want to be rolling her around in a wheelchair. All because they won't hear. This is the message we have to hear. Because something is fixing to tear our houses up and they're fixing to destroy the kingdom. That's why we're asking, will you move when uh, y'all should return to Will he find faith? What would that question need to be asked? Will he find faith? What would they be having faith in? As it, is written, as, it, as it is written. We live by what was written. That's what we believe, what was written. What was written was spoken by him. He said, will he find faith when he returns? Not if everybody got their own mindset. 